secret law has no place in America. Now, I'd like to turn next to the secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the one that virtually nobody knew about a couple of months ago, and now people ask me about at the barber shop. When the FISA court was created as part of the 1978 FISA law, its work was pretty routine. It was assigned to review government applications for wiretaps and decide whether the government was able to show probable cause. For all you lawyers, it sounds like a garden variety function of district courts and district court judges across the country. In fact, their role was so much like a district court that the judges who make up the FISA court are actually current federal district court judges. After 9-11, the Congress, of course, passed the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act, and this gave the government broad new surveillance powers. These new powers didn't resemble anything in either the criminal law enforcement world or actually the original FISA law. The FISA court got the job of interpreting these new unparalleled authorities of the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act. It was their decision to issue binding secret rulings that interpreted the law and the Constitution in the startling way that has come to light in the last six weeks. They were to issue the decision that the Patriot Act could be used for dragnet bulk surveillance of law-abiding Americans. Outside of the names of the FISA court judges, virtually everything else is secret about the court. Their rulings are secret which certainly makes challenging them in an appeals process almost impossible. Their proceedings are secret, but I can tell you they're almost always one-sided. The government lawyers walk in, they lay out the argument for why the government ought to be allowed to do something, and the court decides basically on the judge's assessment of the courts, of the government's arguments. That's not unusual if a court is considering a routine warrant request, but it's very unusual if a court is conducting a major legal or constitutional analysis. I know of no other court in America that strays so far from the adversarial process that has been part of America for centuries. It may also surprise you that when President Obama came to office, his administration agreed with me that these rulings needed to be made public. In the summer of 2009, I received a written commitment from the Justice Department and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence that a process would begin, would be created, to start redacting and declassifying FISA court opinions so that the American people would have some idea of what their government believes the law is allowed to do. In the last four years, exactly zero opinions have been released. Now that we know a bit about secret law and the court that created it, I want to talk about how this has diminished the rights of every American man, woman, and child. Despite the efforts of the intelligence community leadership to downplay the privacy impact of the Patriot Act collection, the bulk collection of phone records significantly impacts the privacy of millions of law-abiding Americans. If you know who someone called, when they called, where they called from, and how long they talked, you lay bare the personal lives of law-abiding Americans to the scrutiny of government bureaucrats and outside contractors. That's the reality of the bulk phone records collection program. This is particularly true if you're vacuuming up cell phone location data, essentially turning everybody's cell phone into a tracking device. Now, we've been told that this isn't happening today, but intelligence officials have told the press that they currently have the legal authority to collect Americans' location information in bulk. Especially troubling is the fact that there is nothing, nothing in the Patriot Act that limits the sweeping bulk collection to phone records. 
the government can use the Patriot Act's business records authority to collect, collate, and retain all sorts of sensitive information, including medical records, financial records, or credit card purchases. They can use this authority to develop, for example, a database of gun owners or readers of books and magazines that are deemed subversive. This means that the government's authority to collect information on law-abiding Americans is essentially limitless at this time. If it is a record held by a business, a membership organization, a doctor, a school, or any other third party, it could be subject to the bulk collection authority under the Patriot Act. Authorities this broad give the national security bureaucracy the power to scrutinize the personal lives of every law-abiding American. Allowing that to continue is a grave error that demonstrates a willful ignorance of human nature. Moreover, it demonstrates a complete disregard for the responsibilities entrusted to us by the Founding Fathers to maintain robust checks and balances on the power of any arm of our government. Now, at this point, I think we've got in front of us some very serious questions. What happens to our government, our civil liberties, and our wonderful system, our basic democracy, if the surveillance state is allowed to grow unchecked? The always expanding, omnipresent surveillance state. What happens if it just keeps growing and growing and growing. As we've seen in recent days, the intelligence leadership is determined to hold on to this authority, merging the ability to conduct surveillance that reveals every aspect of a person's life with the ability to conjure up the legal authority to execute that surveillance, and finally, removing any accountable judicial oversight creates the unprecedented opportunity to influence our system of government. Without additional protections in the law, every single one of us, every one of us, may be and can be tracked and monitored anywhere we are at any time. The piece of technology we consider vital to the conduct of our everyday personal and professional life, all those smartphones, happens to be a combination phone bug, listening device, location tracker and hidden camera. There isn't an American alive who would consent to being required to carry any one of those items. And so we ought to reject the idea that government may use its power to arbitrarily bypass that consent. Today, government officials openly tell the press that they have the authority to effectively turn America's smartphones and cell phones into location-enabled homing beacons. Compounding the problem is the fact that the case law is unsettled on cell phone tracking, and the leaders of the intelligence community have consistently been unwilling to state what the rights of law-abiding people are on this issue. I know that because I've repeatedly asked this in public hearings. And without adequate protections built into the law, there's no way that Americans can ever be sure that the government isn't going to interpret authorities more and more broadly year after year until the idea of a telescreen monitoring your every move turns from dystopia to reality. Now, some are going to say that's never going to happen because there is secret court oversight and secret courts that guard against it. But the fact of the matter is that senior policymakers and federal judges have deferred again and again to the intelligence agencies to decide what surveillance authorities they need. For those who believe executive branch officials will voluntarily interpret their surveillance authorities with restraint, I believe it is more likely that I'll achieve my lifelong dream of playing in the NBA. Now, when James Madison was attempting to persuade Americans that the Constitution contained sufficient protections against any politician or bureaucrat seizing more power than that granted to them by the people, 
he didn't just ask his fellow Americans to trust him. He carefully laid out the protections contained in the Constitution and how the people could ensure that they weren't breached. We are failing our constituents, we are failing our founding fathers, and we are failing every brave man and woman who fought and continues to fight to protect American democracy if we are willing today to just trust any individual or any agency with greater power than the check and limited authority that the founding fathers wanted as a firewall against tyranny. I do want to spend a few minutes talking about those who make up the intelligence community and day in and day out work to protect us all. I have found the men and women who work at our nation's intelligence agencies to be hardworking, dedicated professionals. They're genuine patriots who make real sacrifices to serve their country. And I believe they ought to be able to do their job secure in the knowledge that there is strong public support for everything they're doing. Unfortunately, that can happen when senior officials from across the government mislead the public about the government surveillance authorities. So let's be clear here. The public was not just kept in the dark about the Patriot Act and other secret authorities. The public was actively misled I pointed out several instances in the past where senior officials have made misleading statements to the public and to the Congress about the types of surveillance that they conduct on the public. And I'd like to just focus on several of the most significant examples. For years, senior Justice Department officials have told the Congress and the public that the Patriot Act Business Record Authority, the authority used to collect the phone records of millions of law-abiding Americans is analogous to a grand jury subpoena. Those quotes, they say it is analogous to a grand jury subpoena. That statement is exceptionally misleading. It certainly strains the word analogous beyond the breaking point. It's certainly true that both authorities can be used to collect a wide variety of records. But the Patriot Act has been secretly interpreted to permit ongoing bulk collection. And this makes that authority very, very different from regular grand jury subpoena authority. I'm sure there's some lawyers here. After the speech is over, come up and tell me if you've ever seen a grand jury subpoena that allowed the government on an ongoing basis to collect the records of millions of ordinary Americans. The fact is that no one has ever seen a subpoena like that because there aren't any. This incredibly misleading analogy has been made by more than one official on more than one occasion and often as a part of actual testimony to the United States Congress. The official who served for years as the Justice Department's top authority on criminal surveillance recently told the Wall Street Journal what he really thinks about this. And he said, if a federal attorney, and I quote here, served the grand jury subpoena for such a broad class of records in a criminal investigation, he or she would be last out of court. Now, defenders of this deception have said that members of Congress have the ability to get the full story of what the government is doing on a classified basis. So they shouldn't complain when officials make misleading statements, even in a congressional hearing. This is an absurd argument. Sure, members of Congress could get the full story in a classified setting, but that doesn't excuse the practice of half-truths and misleading statements 